brief um, introduction um, to the content. As we are all aware, of course, the European Union is currently facing the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic and as a result, perhaps the worst economic crisis in its history. Next Wednesday, on the 1st of July 2020, Germany is going to take over the presidency of the Council of the EU in these uh, times. During this time, one of the main goals will be to navigate the EU out of the crisis. However, it would be just as important to help stabilize the EU's immediate neighborhood. Um, the last months have shown that the EU's eastern and southeastern neighbors are particularly vulnerable to the crisis and its socioeconomic impacts. That's why it's crucial for the EU to support them, both as an act of solidarity and for the sake of peace and stability on the European continent. Therefore, the EU immediately provided medical equipment to the neighboring countries and eventually allocated 3.3 billion euro to support the Western Balkans and 1 billion euro to the Eastern Partnership countries to address the COVID-19 outbreak and its long-term impact. For the German presidency, challenge will also be to keep pushing forward the enlargement process with the Western Balkans and to deepen the relations with the Eastern Partnership countries despite this crisis. Fortunately, both regions have seen achievements in their political relations with the EU shortly before the Corona crisis hit. Um, on 24th of March 2020, the General Affairs Council finally gave its green light to open the accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. This was a long awaited and necessary step, which the German government and with some reservations the Bundestag had supported along with the European Commission already for a while. For the Eastern Partnership, the Commission launched a consultation process last year to work out a new policy framework um, for the Eastern Partnership beyond uh, 2020 and presented a proposal for this in March of this year also. And even though the preparation process of the new framework will be delayed due to the crisis, the overall focus of the Commission's proposal on strengthening resilience in the region could hardly be more up to date. Having said this, I would like to move on to the main questions of our panel debate today. How can the EU prove itself to be a credible and supportive partner for its eastern and southern eastern um, neighbors during the corona crisis? And how can it actively and effectively use the crisis to add value to the regions and deepen its ties with its neighboring countries instead of running into the danger of drifting apart? Um, I would first like to give the floor to Edgar Gansen. He is the head of the Division for EU Enlargement and Neighborhood Policy in the German Federal Foreign Office since September 2016. And um, as for the other speakers, you can find more detailed information about him uh, also on the website of our conference. Um, Edgar Gansen, the floor is yours. You will need to unmute your microphone so that we can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've already given an overview of where we stand in, in much of the processes um, or where we stood before the COVID crisis. Um, we've had two main goals for, the, for our EU presidency when it comes to the Eastern Partnership, which we consider a political priority. We are planning three meetings and we want, would have wanted to um, give a lot of impetus to the process. Uh, same is true for the enlargement process where we um, are preparing the opening of accession negotiations in practical terms with uh, Albania and North Macedonia. And no need to explain that the COVID crisis turned many things uh, up and down and, uh, and uh, a lot of um, processes need to be refocused because we have very practical problems with the um, in, with the number of meetings that we can hold. Um, we face problems with uh, coming up with agreed text um, uh, proposals because it's much more difficult to see these things through um, in virtual meetings than in real meetings. And a lot of what um, we're planning for the presidency will then uh, step by step be developed um, um, while we're going through it. I'd like to focus um, a little bit on, on the enlargement part of, of, of our topic here, um, on the question you asked, um, uh, what does the EU need to do to be a credible partner when it comes to these policies? Um, and it's three main theses I'd, I'd like to work on. Um, the first is current enlargement process is a geopolitical must for the European Union. Um, the second is we need a balanced approach. We need a strict conditionality 
and a clear perspective at the same time for the candidate countries. And the third is candidate countries need to be able to run through this process step by step on an individual basis. Let me enter into the question, geopolitical must. Um, that seems a given. Um, many are nodding when we talk about why the EU needs to, to continue the enlargement process. Um, the Western Balkan states are right in Europe, they share borders with EU uh, partners. Um, the internal development in those states has a direct impact on many EU states, not least Germany, as seen in the Balkan Wars. The, um, also when it comes to migration, organized crime, extremist activities, these are all areas um, where the EU has an overwhelming interest in stabilizing the region and realigning the EU borders in, in a whole. Um, and also, of course, with a view to possible interference with others, that's an issue that's been recently more discussed. Um, um, we want to see the EU be the, the partner in the region, and we want to see the EU moving forward and, and trying to sort, in a way, realign its borders here. Um, Yes, that seems to be a, a given. When we talk in four like this, everybody's nodding. Why am I mentioning it? Um, when we talk to the general public, maybe you as well as I, when our political players talk to the general public at home, um, that's not a given at all. Um, the same arguments that I just used in favor of, of proceeding with the enlargement process are used to the opposite in the opposite sense. People are saying, well, we have organized crime, we have all these problems you mentioned, that that leads us to the conclusion that these states are not fit and possibly will never be fit to join the EU. Why would the government, apart from what the general public thinks, move along with this process? We even had that discussion in the Bundestag, you mentioned it, um, uh, briefly when we were to decide on the opening of accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia, we had uh, quite a number of members of the German Bundestag who were strictly opposed and then only step by step could be convinced uh, by the argument, which is clear to us, but still by the argument, that uh, the entering into negotiations is not the, the joining, the, the admission to the EU. So that's been a very difficult, a difficult argument. And even some member states, as in that case, France, when it came to Albania or the Netherlands, were not really in favor and were not buying the argument that the enlargement process is the best way of stabilizing the countries. They agreed that it was one way, but, uh, but, but many made the point that there were other ways too. Um, so that's what leads me to my second point. To be credible in that process, we need a very strict conditionality. We need clear criteria, we need detailed benchmarks, as in many areas we have, in many areas we don't. We have a general understanding that the UAC needs to be fulfilled, but to lead those countries, to make them able to fulfill these criteria, we need to break this down. We need to make we, we need to help them by breaking down um, um, the acquis into little bits that can be fulfilled and that can also be checked. Um, there are member states that would rather want to increase the speed, I would say the speed of the process over the seriousness of the, of the checking of the criteria. Um, and many argue that the Candidate countries need to be able to feel that they are moving forward to be able to include their their general public, their population in, in the process. That's a very important element. Um, uh, we, that's why I was saying, um, and, and that's our German position, we need a clear perspective. The EU has set out rules that, and conditions that need to be met to be able to join the EU. But also, in the end, it has made clear at a number of occasions that these states will then be able um, to join the EU, but 
then we come to the question, how do we keep this process going over possibly a long period of time? Um, and I would go as far as to say, if it takes time to fulfill all these criteria, then it does take time and that's maybe a good thing. Um, why is that so? Um, many of these countries have administrations that cannot cope with all the issues that are on the table at the same time. So they need to be able to focus, refocus, to work on one issue after the other and then go through the process step by step. And that's something that we we would want um, an ability that we would want to give that. I mean, when we discussed French proposals to um, readjust the methodology of uh, accession negotiations, we were quite critical on the idea that member states would negotiate in clusters, that one cluster of a number of negotiation chapters would be opened at the same time, would then negotiated at the same time and would only close, be closed, the whole cluster, once all the issues were settled. Um, that's a system that would not only possibly take extremely long to, to run through, but that would also require the states to look into all the issues at the same time. Um, in a way of compromise, we then came up in, um, in spring with a, with a solution that includes the opening of chapters in one step, but not necessarily the closing. So there is some flexibility, and that's something we desperately need to, to, um, to open all options for these states to concentrate on certain issues and then have these issues sorted out. And only then um, we will be able, that's our, our assumption, to end up with a credible process to end up with um, a final, we need, we need to come up at a, at a certain moment in time and where we can say countries have fulfilled um, all the criteria that are on the table. And that'll be a politically decisive moment. In that moment, we again need to have our general public on board. We need to be able to make the point that these countries are fit to join and uh, to be able to see this through, um, we feel that we need to have this uh, credible process. It is not that anybody would want to play for time to postpone the enlargement process. It is rather that um, the most recent example of the uh, discussions on the opening of accession negotiations with Albania has proven again that if, if if we cannot make the point or even prove that criteria are fulfilled, then we'll have a general political problem. And recent developments seem to have shown that it'll be very difficult in future um, in the EU to take far-reaching political decisions um, when the general public is not on board. That's the reasoning behind it. Um, and that's why, why we feel we need this flexible approach. As I said, in our presidency, we'll be focusing on the next steps, and that's the negotiation frameworks that need to be um, sort out, sorted out now for uh, Northern uh, Macedonia and Albania. And if possible, we hope very much for opening of the first accession conference with um, Northern Macedonia. And if Albania meets the criteria that are set out in the council conclusions, which include the criteria by the Bundestag and the Dutch parliament, um, then hopefully also with Albania. Um, but that's, that's the next concrete steps in the process. Thank you very much. Edgar Gansen, thank you very much for outlining these three uh, points. And uh, I think it will be interesting to pick up maybe in the Q&A session, the relevance of the publics that you mentioned several times in this process and how that has changed maybe to previous enlargement rounds. But um, first of all, now I would like to um, give the floor to, to Ilke Teugur. She is an analyst at Elcano Royal Institute for International and Strategic, Strategic Studies in Madrid and also a lecturer of political science at Carlos University of Madrid. It. And she will also speak to us about enlargement uh, more in general and also on EU Turkey relations. Ilke, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to all IEPP team for, for organizing this uh, very interesting virtual conference. We all wish we were in, in Berlin right now, but uh, given the circumstances, it has been going great so far. Actually, I will pick up where Mr. Gansen has left because he has shortly underlined that the, 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 the importance of the political importance of enlargement policy. And I wanted to start with a, with a quick overview of this throughout the decades for the European Union. After that, I will clearly connect it to the unique Susanaris case of Turkey-EU relations because we, we clearly have a, have a problem uh, there that we cannot fix. So the, the, the enlargement policy has been the most effective foreign policy tool of the European Union from the very beginning and it has always been very geopolitical. Since the, the, the aftermath of the Second World War, both the, the, the integration process uh, itself, integration project itself, and the conditionality that is connected to that integration project was changing and evolving to have neighborhood countries, region by region, or to the, the, the political sphere of the European Union. Why am I underlining this, the, the, the importance of uh, the linkage between the project itself and conditionality? Because we have seen with, uh, with throughout the years, throughout the decades, and with different waves of enlargement, the conditionality, which is the core of the transformation that, that the European Union is looking for in its neighborhood, evolving. The, it has started with the, the, the democracy and democratic institutions and human rights dimension when it was Spain, Portugal, and Greece. Then we added the, the functioning of markets economy, well functioning of the market economy, once the, the European integration project also introduced the single market and MEU, then uh, when the decades passed over, the EU introduced respect for minority rights, basic freedoms, etc. and rule of law. And when we started to come to the Eastern European countries and Balkans, suddenly good neighbor, the neighborly relations and border management were also in the agenda. So every time that the, the integration projects evolved, the conditionality and what was expected from the candidate states evolved as well. And following these steps uh, externally, all these countries uh, became member, members. And what was in the core of this process was exactly the relationship between the conditionality, strict conditionality, and the clear perspective for, for membership, what has been given as the, the, the second point in Mr. Gensen's talk. If we want to connect this logic to the case of Turkey, this is where we have a problem and where, this is where the, 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 the connection between conditionality and, and a clear perspective for membership is getting broken and we are facing a sui generis candidate states, the longest term candidate states in the, uh, in the, in the European Union. As we all know, uh, the membership talks are right now uh, dysfunctional in the case of the, 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 the the Turkish candidacy, but clearly it is still preferred to an undefined strategic partnership, so none of the sides are, are willing to break it out uh, for now. Turkey is a candidate country since 1999 and it's in the accession process since 2005 until one, 16 chapters have been open and one was only provisionally closed. In June 2018, the accession negotiations has officially entered to its stalemate because we we have con council conclusions for not opening any other chapters or closing them or moving towards uh, a modernized uh, customs union. So Turkey's uh, case is very sui generis. But what I would like to do today, what I would like to introduce, of course I can talk more about Turkey's candidacy because I think it's uh, well known by uh, many of us here, is connecting this situation to foreign policy today. Because we have seen uh, Mr. Borrell, High Representative Vice President in, in Greece and, and Cyprus these days, uh, basically uh, confirming and reaffirming solidarity to these countries because these member states had various issues and still having various issues in, with Turkey right now. So we are having a case here, we are, we are witnessing a case here, a candidate country not necessarily effective uh, enlargement process for decades now, and the certain issues of foreign policy where we not necessarily know how to solve, we don't even have an effective platform to deal with. So enlargement policy being the, the, the most effective uh, foreign policy tool, the EU is not necessarily prepared 
when it comes to a candidate country that, that was gone bad or the a relationship candidacy status or enlargement status that, that has gone bad. So we have also, in addition to that, we have a, a, a country, Turkey, which is way more assertive in its foreign policy, since, especially since its transition to, to, to presidential regime, it is not necessarily faithful to its uh, Western alliance, not necessarily moving towards any other actor, but basically juggling its alliances and then trying to counterbalance them, them and not necessarily uh, shying off from, uh, from unilateral usage of force. So with this, we have various issues on the table. We are facing tensions in, in, in Syria and now more frequently in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we have a European Union that is not necessarily having tools or having the toolbox to deal with this because the, the only existing framework on, on, on in this regard is not necessarily functioning anymore. So this is uh, basically what I wanted to introduce when it comes to the case of Turkey, because uh, we might all remember right before the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic hit us all, uh, Turkey was moving Syrian uh, refugees towards the Greek border. And I'm, I'm sure this, this, this issue will, will come back in the, in, in the fall. And I, I, I would very much like to, to hear the opinions of Mr. Gunson on that regard and what is the plan of the German presidency in that regard. But the, the, I know I have few time left, so I, I, left, so I would like to, to kind of conclude it with this. Enlargement policy is the, 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 the most effective foreign policy tool that the European Union has or had, it has been reflecting the internal uh, project, internal integration project to the neighborhood with the, the idea of conditionality and preparing all these countries to become members with a clear perspective uh, for membership, which I think I'm sure that, that we will talk about that when it comes to Western Balkans as well. But when it comes to Turkey, now we are lacking the power to apply conditionality, uh, lacking the, 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 the clear perspective on membership and we have lots of problems when it comes to the relationship on foreign policy in general but bilateral relations between Turkey and neighboring uh, EU countries in particular. So we have a puzzle there and I would be very happy to elaborate further on what I think the, 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 the solution or how we should uh, bring this issue in a more positive ground in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for pointing out this puzzle and I also look forward to discussing this in the Q&A session. Um, but first I would like to give the floor to Daniela Yatsimovic. Uh, she is a professor at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Montenegro and has a particular focus on the economic dimension of the stabilization association process and the accession process of the Western Balkans. And I look forward to hearing her intervention. Daniela, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me here and just uh, giving the opportunity just to share some ideas and views that we have here in the Western Balkans and trying to find sustainable convergence with the EU in this very, very delicate time of the COVID-19. So, yes, as you said, I'm the economist and here in Montenegro and I believe in all Western Balkans, we are really, really focused how to manage the socioeconomic impact of the a virus and I think that I was zooming all these two months in a different debate in the TV and with the government how we how we should treat it properly. So just to say like in most countries in the world, Western Balkan countries will enter to the recession this year and based on the recent World Bank projection, the slope of the GDP will be for now minus 5.7%. The reason for that is that the region is really intensively economically integrated with the EU, so the lockdown of the EU economies has caused a sharp decrease in demand of our goods and services, and what is even more important, diminishing investment and migrant remittances from the EU. So from the autumn, we will have all new governments and they will really face uh, very, very hard times and two the biggest challenges and one challenge for sure will be how to manage socio impact uh, socio impact socioeconomic impact of covid 19 and another challenge will be new enlargement strategy where political criteria is just an imperative so it is not really hard to 
guess what will be the most important priority for our government governments it for sure will be managing economic social impact and actually from the march governments in all our countries are really discussing how to manage and how to the best manage survival of our economies so yes political criteria is very important but i don't know in which content, in which time, in which time, our governments as well as well as the general public can really focus in this new enlargement uh, criteria and the political criteria as a focus. So yes, I do agree that for both parties it is very important to ensure for the democratization of our society. It is very important to have good implementation of rule of law, combating corruption and organized crime in the region. But I'm not quite sure in which extent and how much we can do it in a medium or a short term. So um, it appears that Western Balkan countries are quite different from those from Central Eastern Europe. And in our region, geopolitics constantly play important law role in uh, our convergence. Russia has had traditionally strong historical, cultural, religious ties in the region. But China and its presence can be, has been very visible through a lot of infrastructure investments like tourism, energy, uh, transport, uh, industrial production. We can talk about Balkan Silk Road, Road and it's very visible, especially after financial crisis. So when we are talking about Western Balkans, as, as Mr. Gansen said, we need a lot of time. So the reason for that is that almost each step forward in our integration process have been powerful, have been just the battle among powerful pull and push factors, almost equal strength. And all that have made process of enlargement very slowly, very long and certain. That is really why important why the recent Zagreb declaration emphasized for the first time formal and explicitly that uh, region is geopolitically important for the region for the EU. However, declaration make, makes no specific mention of enlargement, no new membership, no EU integration for um, any country. We are all aware that international system is changing and it is increasingly evident that China is, is establishing new balance of power in the world. China is willing and able to support countries seeking for financial assistance and China is trying to, in the same time, to fulfill their, its strategic goals and that role, I will say, will be more and more dominant in post-COVID era. I would just like to recall you to the experience of the Western Balkan that we had at March when, pan when pandemic arrived in the region. So the first countries that offer medical equipment and uh, advice were Russia, China, Turkey, Emirates. Fortunately, in May, EU responded with significant 3.3 billion of euros of uh, COVID-19 emergency relief for the region. But to achieve sustainable convergence with the EU, Western Balkan countries need to achieve 6 to 8% annual growth and 25% of investments of the GDP. For all countries in the region, they are very, for them, they are very reliant on FDI flows and the speed of their recovery and sustainable convergence with the EU will really deepen on the inflow of the capital. I'm just emphasizing that as, as I'm the economist, but you know, it is very hard to believe that there will be any significant capital inflow into Western Balkans in short or to medium term. So I will say that the most important challenge and tense facing the Western Balkan countries as well as the EU during and after pandemic will be how can Western Balkan countries fill the day's investment gap? Is there any lesson learned from the financial crisis 2008-2009? So financial crisis really hit region even harder than EU itself with minimum financial crisis assistance with the EU especially given that both Montenegro and Kosovo use the euro. 
So it's very hard to be com to to be com uh, to beat on uh, foreign markets. So the financially and economic impact of the crisis affected regional de developments in three, I will say, special um, three ways in the last 12 years. First, socially, people, especially young people, young professionals, they stopped hoping that they would that they would experience better time or prosperity. So they are actively looking to access to the EU working permits. When we are talking about politically, our societies have turned to right-wing populist and authoritarian forces. Economically, the region has increasingly looked in China in hope to attract larger foreign investments. The economic theory suggests that countries that should be treated well and with care when they are under distress, as Jeffrey Sachs argued in his last interview in The Economist Asks on June 20. In his interview, he quoted as well as Keynes' view from the early 90s, so almost end of the Cold War, or when Keynes said, do not crimp the future of these countries, but keep their way forward with a fresh start. So coming back to the 2020, it is chance for Europe to restart its convergence engine, showing strong global leadership with playing a major role in, feeling, in fulfilling the current investment gap in Western Balkan countries, contributing to survival of really fragile socioeconomic and political system in the region and strongly delivering the message that without the Western Balkan, the European project is unfinished. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward for your questions and the comments. Daniela, thank you very much um, also for, for your points uh, and uh, I think they tie in very well with the previous speakers but also uh, underline some of the economic elements and I'm sure that uh, the other speakers will be happy to um, react also to your presentation. We have two um, uh, discussants who will be taking the floor first um, and who I'm happy will be uh, also expanding the topic a little bit towards uh, the Eastern Partnership countries, um, which I think is um, something that is very useful because I, I think I'm sure that we will see that there are quite a few parallels of what we have discussed so far. Of course, there being institutional differences also. And um, the first discussant is uh, Georgi Kristovani, who is the Associate Professor and Head of Finance and Investments Department of the Business School of Ilya State University in Tbilisi. And at the same time, he is a Research Director at uh, PMC Research Center, which is an independent Georgian think tank that is focusing on economic development. And I look forward to your discussion, discussion intervention. The floor is yours. Thank you, Katrin. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I will concentrate my short uh, speech on three issues. First of all, COVID-19 and uh, its possible impact on Georgia and its on Georgia's relation with the EU. I believe that uh, in this crisis, uh, EU can uh, really became uh, the major driver for uh, incentivizing uh, structural reforms in Georgia, uh, especially during the recovery phase in 2020-2021. Uh, and I think this can both stimulate Georgia's socio-economic development uh, and uh, also the integration process. Uh, uh, and why I'm thinking so? Because the crisis will uh, very hardly hit our economy and uh, support from you, financial support, will be crucial. And uh, this uh, can be used as a more incentive uh, for uh, Georgia from EU side to further the continued structural reforms. Of course, this also bears risks because uh, one of the main reasons why Georgia achieved the resilience, economic one, is, was economic freedom and the more or less liberal, deregulated economic model. And to, in today's Georgia, the problem is that uh, um, the majority of uh, regulatory changes are um, linked to association agreement. In most of the cases, wrongly. So each time government starts new uh, phase of uh, regulating economy, uh, it is uh, mentioning often very much that this is part of our association agreement with the EU. And this can have very bad result on the perception 
of the agreement on of the EU integration process, and uh, this can uh, this uh, this possibility of uh, strengthening and uh, uh, making a structural reforms process uh, stronger in Georgia bears also risks. Another uh, opinion is about um, Eastern Partnership uh, as a as a project, uh, and uh, I guess uh, the policy should. Uh, uh, beyond 2020 should uh, address the challenges Eastern Partnership countries are facing in the process of especially economic integration with the EU, despite having uh, free trade agreements. Why? Because um, uh, several uh, studies uh, also conducted by our research center indicates that uh, economic uh, effects of the free trade agreements, if they are available, are very limited. And uh, so that's why uh, and it shows that, for instance, Georgia's economy is not yet competitive enough to enjoy benefits from free trade agreements with the European Union. And uh, that's, uh, that leads um, uh, to, the, uh, to the point that uh, some kind of political perspective or a perspective of more political integration should be visible because of the economic effects are limited. Uh, because we are, uh, and uh, because uh, in the in the in today in today's Georgia, although there are a lot of uh, excitement uh, because of the visa-free regime and other opportunities for use, especially and people who want can travel visa-free to Georgia, to Europe, there are also some kind of skepticism because of uh, not clearly visible economic effects. Uh, and yet, uh, the, as I mentioned, the association agreement is a kind of uh, linked with new regulations, new rules, new, uh, new norms that, uh, that Georgian businesses have to comply with, uh, and, and the results are not yet visible. So I guess this might be a challenge, challenging issue. And final point it's about uh, german presidency we have uh, crucial elections in uh, october 2020 and um, uh, we have we are uh, it, it is already clear that eu uh, can play a major uh, role uh, in um, supporting georgia's democracy so that we will have uh, fair elections in 2020 and uh, i i truly believe that uh, only with uh, active support from EU side during German presidency, we can have in Georgia really fair elections. And uh, this be, might be the most important issue for the next six months in Georgia to guarantee this. And you can play a massive role in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgie, very much uh, for adding this. Uh layer to, to the discussion. Um, and now for our final discussions before we open the floor for the Q&A and I would like to remind the participants at this time that you um, are happy to um, already enter questions or raise your hand um, so that you can speak in the Q&A after this final presentation. Um, I will now give the floor to uh, Dr. Yuri Yakimenko who is the president of the Ukrainian think tank Razumkov Center in Kiev, um, which is also a partner of Institute for European Politik, which I may add at this point. And uh, he has worked before joining the Razumkov Center at the administration of the president of Ukraine as a political analyst for many years. Um, Yuri, the floor is yours. Yes, fine. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, dear colleagues, greetings from Kiev, from Ukraine. Uh, I'd like to say, uh, to start my uh, brief uh, intervention into discussion, the statements of Mr. Johnson that I can completely support because they have a practical implications for Ukrainian process of Euro integration. First of all, uh, statements that current Atlantic process is a geopolitical must for the European Union means that for us in Ukraine, uh, the next wave of enlargement of Western Balkans won't be uh, the next one won't be the last and ukraine somehow will have a chance to uh, to become a member of european union in the future and it's not uh, the neighborhood policy for us is not uh, the state of affairs it's just a partnership uh, we think that for us it's a process with a very 
uh, definite goal, the complete membership in the European Union. And here I'd like to uh, step to the next uh, point, that we need uh, a balanced approach to conditionality and a clear perspective for, the, for candidate countries. For us uh, as well, it's very important because uh, we are in the process of uh, European reforms that should lead us to a certain set of criteria that Ukraine should meet uh, before it uh, will be prepared well to further accession to the EU. Uh, but the problem is uh, that we uh, probably need uh, more uh, detailed indicators of progress uh, and indicators how to meet this conditionality. It uh, makes this, this process more understood both for public and for our partners. Because, for instance, in some spheres like reform of judiciary system, fight and corruption, and reform of uh, state institutions, uh, we need uh, something more understood in order to access uh, to to assess the progress in these fields. Uh, and again, that uh, point number three is that candidate countries should be able to go uh, to run the process on an individual basis. Of course, uh, each country from uh, the ma each member of uh, Eastern Na Neighborhood Policy of uh, Eastern Partnership. Uh, has its own track, and Ukraine has uh, its own track. It's maybe different from other countries, and it is reflected in uh, association agreement between the EU and Ukraine. And uh, for this situation, uh, I would move over some Ukrainian priorities in European uh, integration for this moment. Uh, firstly, of course, it's about uh, uh, pandemic recovery, because we need uh, developing partnership in health, pharmacology, uh, also support of small and medium business, tact on unemployment, and uh, so on. Uh, also, it's very uh, sensible issue of uh, adopting visa-free regime in the post-quarantine period, because uh, for uh, a lot of Ukrainian people, the, the problem of moving to the EU countries, it's uh, very, it's just a little problem. Uh, another point is the uh, need for economization of the partnership. And uh, here we uh, could speak about the extension of the EU economic recovery programs to the Eastern Partnership region, for instance. Uh, involvement of six countries in uh, transcontinental infrastructure projects of the European Union. And also we can say about uh, some uh, policy, new policy formats for partnership uh, as introduction of the EU plus three enhanced uh, dialogue format, as key of Greece and Chisinau insist. And of course, uh, I can't uh, avoid uh, an issue of uh, cooperation in the sphere of security, because for Ukraine, uh, as for Georgia and as for Moldova, it's especially important. And uh, I should mention as very uh, relevant uh, uh, section number four from recommendation of the EU uh, about uh, enhancing of Eastern partnership, especially security, stability, territorial integrity, and conflict management. Uh, because, uh, as we see from uh, recent declarations from Russia, from Kremlin, uh, that there are uh, new evidence of continuation of neo-imperialist policy, and uh, some things justify further territorial claims for post-Soviet countries. We think it's very dangerous, not only for Ukraine, but for Europe at all. And because of that, we uh, see that European solidarity in support of territorial integrity and sovereignty of countries of Eastern Partnership, as well as uh, restraining of Russians' attempt to break uh, European integration of our countries. Uh, I can say this from the Ukrainian perspective, but I think it's uh, also uh, maybe said about Western, Western Balkans and our uh, neighbor countries, post-Soviet countries. It's also a very important issue. Uh, that's all what I would like to say for this moment. Thank you. Yes, Yuri, thank you very much um, for your points also for the discussion. Um, now I would invite uh, all the participants again to um, uh, uh, raise their hand or to raise um, a question in the chat function. We have already a first question uh, to Edgar Gansen, whom I think might also be interested in responding to some of the other uh, presentations. Um, and uh, I would like to ask, um, invite Barbara Lippert um, to switch on her camera and uh, to ask her question if she would like to do so. 
Yes, hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Gansen uh, uh, and concerns the new methodology for enlargement. Uh, and the question is, do you see any improvements uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, revision? And uh, are there more on the side of the EU uh, or on the side of the, the candidates? Thank you. Barbara Lippert, thank you very much. Um, since there are no other questions at the moment, I think I will give the floor directly um, to Edgar Gansen if he would like to respond uh, to the question and also if he would like to make any additional comments. Edgar Gansen, please. I think you still have to switch on your microphone again. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Lippert, for that straightforward question. <laughs> I hope you don't expect a straightforward answer. <laughs> the answer is yes, there may be room for improvement. Um, I believe it, it may be, have become quite clear that we weren't in favor of changing the methodology straight away. Um, we thought that the way we work through the individual chapters, the way we work with the member, with the candidate states was slow but successful and as I tried to make clear in my presentation, it had many advantages. Now we have elements that can be used um, to, to make the process better as a more detailed um, prescription of the, of the individual um, tasks that need to be fulfilled. There are other elements like the political steering or um, the opening up of chapters, or a number of chapters in a cluster at the same time that may work to the disadvantage. So the proof is in the eating. <laughs> we need to make the best of it, uh, I, I would say. Um, um, we are in favor of improving the process wherever it's possible. And if that third element um, that we will be discussing later in the year, um, when the commission is supposed to make proposals, that's increased support of the member states, uh, of the candidate states, uh, adds to it, then we might end up with a, a positive package, I would say. But that's an important element and that hasn't been discussed yet and we're still waiting for proposals on this. And I would also like to touch, if I may, <coughs> on Ilke Toigur's point of um, the best um, EU foreign policy instrument, and that is EU enlargement. Um, that is one of the effects the enlargement process has, but I'm, I would be reluctant to call it a foreign policy instrument. I mean, it's, it's in a way an instrument of growing of the community. Um, and you made the point that the conditionality was involving, evolving, that's because the number of states was increasing and also the number of issues of policy areas that we're dealing with increased too. And um, there's very early been the, um, the understanding that members may only join if they're able and willing to take up all that portfolio of things that had been agreed on earlier on. And that's why, of course, um, the, the conditionality is evolving and the, the criterion of, um, of good neighborly um, relationship um, wasn't a criterion earlier on because there were no problems in the, in the first group that, that joined. I mean, at that time, it was to overcome certain problems we had in, in Europe, but um, good neighborly relations, as we understand it now, was no issue at that time. Um, so yes, Turkey is longest standing uh, candidate, um, and maybe the EU has no means of dealing with it within the enlargement process, but that is also due to the fact that um, if one external player, let me put it that way, if one external player gets in trouble with a member of a club, possibly there's a problem with the club. And that is what happens again and again. Uh, and that makes it very difficult within the EU to agree on, um, on moving in one or the other direction. So the, we call the enlargement process for the time being frozen because it's not moving. But you may be well aware that there are member states that would have wanted to have it ended earlier or taken other steps. So in a way, um, we're in a waiting position and 
and and in a sense of realpolitik and uh, trying to cope with the issues as they come up if that's <laughs> if that's an explanation i mean if that's not our eu policy but that's enlargement in the european union turkey policy <laughs> Um, Edgar Gansen, thank you very much. Um, I have now um, Minna Orlander who has a question, but um, Ilke Tolge, she also raised her hand and I think she might want to react directly since you also addressed her. Ilke, if that's the case, I will give you the floor, otherwise I would take the question first. Thank you very much. I really appreciate Mr. Gansen's uh, honest answer in that regard, but I would like to push a bit further and, and I wanted to ask a direct question on what would be the, the, the German presidency's policy or policies uh, related to, to Turkey, not in the enlargement sphere, not in the enlargement framework necessarily, but for example, when it comes to the, 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 the issue of irregular migration or recent tensions between Turkey and, and concrete member states like Cyprus or Greece, even France, uh, etc. So I was wondering, because it's not, Turkey is not necessarily involved in the program of German presidency, as far as I know, and, and I would like to know if there is a concrete plan on dealing with any of the issues that are, that are kind of related to, to Turkey, not in the enlargement framework, but in the foreign policy framework. Thank you very much. Edgar Gansen, would you like to react immediately? Yes. yes. Thank you. Turkey is an important partner in many ways. It's economically an important partner. It's for strategic reason, an important partner. It's an historic partner. So then there are many, um, issues that lead us to the conclusion that we need to work on step by step on improving relations, the relations. There are certain issues, you mentioned the, it's the Mediterranean or the migration issue um, that are in our understanding pushed forward by Turkey and that don't make it easy to find a proper EU answer. Um, but still we are very concentrated on sorting out things where they pop up and where we can. So that's maybe why it's not shining up that much in the, in the program, because it's dealing with issues as they come up to get a constructive way forward. Yes, thank you very much for, for taking this um, question, which is not easy to answer because the situation simply is very complex, I think. Um, now, uh, I would like to thank Mina Orlander for her patience um, and I would like to give the floor to her for her question. Um, and uh, I, she, I'm happy if she would like to turn on her camera as well. Otherwise, if she just turns on her microphone, I, we will hear you as well. Sorry, I was actually waiting for uh, the host to turn it on, but of course here we are all uh, autonomous. Um, so thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Um, my question is, as I mentioned to Georgi, um, I was listening with great interest to your input and um, I have to say uh, that I have observed similar tendencies that um, the FTAs probably uh, do not work um, yet for Georgia and um, that also um, regulation is probably like take when you consider the course, uh, the political course that uh, Georgia has taken in the past, let's say 20 years, um, is not probably exactly that that is wished for, as you also correctly said. So um, my question is, because these are the two things that the EU uh, basically can offer. Uh, and I mean, the EU has mastered um, regulating uh, pretty much everything. And uh, it, like FTAs are uh, free trade is the one thing that's like, access to the common market is the one thing that is considered to be the main attraction of the EU. Um, and it's also basically what the EAP is mainly about. So. Um, my, what I, am, I have been wondering um, is what exactly does Georgia expect from the EU? Like, even if Georgia managed to get membership, membership in the EU, um, that wouldn't change the problem because then again, it would be mainly about the common market and a lot of regulation, like a ton of regulation. Um, so is this clear in Georgia? Like, because I do feel that the, the, the aspiration to reach membership is still quite, it's still there, right? So um, why actually? <laughs> and um, is there any, like, like, what do you think, how could the EU basically reach 
Georgia better? Is there maybe a communication, communication problem as well? And also, is it maybe slowly da dawning on the Georgians that um, the EU possibly cannot give Georgia what it needs or what it wants, and that it's not necessarily the best option for Georgia to aspire a membership? Um, or is there some kind of like a debate in Georgia about what would be an option? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will pass the floor di directly to Georgie for, for an answer to this question. Mina, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting question and a very difficult question. Uh, for Georgia, uh, uh, for instance, uh, visa-free regime was very important uh, issue for the society. So uh, free travel to Europe was always uh, an issue. And uh, after having this uh, achie achievement, uh, I guess uh, for most of Georgians, uh, this was the uh, this was the main goal uh, in the uh, in their uh, perspective what Georgia could achieve. Uh, next issue is security. I guess that uh, in Georgian public discourse, uh, uh, the issue of security is very important one. And uh, here there is a clear vision. I guess in the society that uh, EU is the more, maybe only way EU integration is the only way for Georgia security to ensure Georgia security and this Russian treaty is always present and the uh, Russian uh, uh, mis disinformation campaigns and everything is related actually to uh, somehow strengthen this uh, thinking uh, not so sorry to uh, threaten this thinking uh, and uh, i guess the security is the most important thing today but at the same time as i mentioned there is a there is there are not clear uh, impression in the society which other aspects of uh, eu integration may benefit georgia so we have visa free regime and at the same time if we will have kind of security assurance from EU side, this might be already enough. Because uh, otherwise, I can say that uh, economically, uh, there are no real ties. And as I, I already, I, I will repeat it, but at the, at the moment, there is very hard for Georgia economic ag agents to be competitive at, on European markets. And because it will take, uh, I guess, decades, of development, of increasing competitiveness, to be able to compete on European markets. That's why at least there is more political integration needed to have a kind of short-term political and socio-economic and political goals in the country. Because otherwise, as I already mentioned, the most of actions uh, uh, which are related uh, socio-economic and pol uh, are related to uh, uh, and linked to Europe are mainly it's about new regulations and it's about new guidelines for doing something differently and what the problem here is is that uh, uh, it's not always the pro you you is not always the problem the problem is that some political and economic groups lobbying some uh, in, in initiatives but uh, explaining all this with the, with the, with the process of uh, EU integration and this is a risk uh, this is a risky game for georgia and i believe that this is the main reason why we need today in georgia some political perspective because it will and the, uh, what does mean also very important it's that we have also free trade agreements with china and if you compare, there is a lot more economic effect, positive economic effect with the free trade agreement with China than with Europe. And it shows that uh, you, having free trade agreements is not enough. You need competitive economy. And this is the problem Georgia is facing today. 
and uh, I'm not sure that we will be able in midterm to achieve the level of competitiveness needed to be uh, uh, to be uh, to play in this. Um, George he seems to have a few problems with this technical um, setup, but I think he made his point. I think, I Mina, mean, uh, thank you for your question and also Georgie for your reply to this. Um, I don't see any further questions at this time and our, uh, also our time is almost up, but I would like to give a chance to those two uh, speakers who did not uh, have a chance to reply to the discussion if they have uh, any final words. So Daniela and Yuri. And, all the other panelists, if they want to uh, intervene again, they should please raise their hands, then I will also give them the floor. Otherwise, Daniela, I will um, give the floor to you first, and then Yuri afterwards for some final remarks, if you have any. So Daniela, you would need to unmute yourself again, and then we will hear you. Oh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Unfortunately, I didn't have any questions so that I can refer to, but I really do cop as a well, citizen of Montenegro, as the smallest uh, Western Balkan countries. And uh, to say that I would really like to see all our countries once upon a time in the European Union. And when you gave me the floor i will just since i'm economist and i'm international economics so when we make a balance of payment if there is five percent discrepancy we say okay statistical error so balance of payment is perfect or any international statistic is perfect so uh when we are talking about the figures and when we are talking about western balkan countries and uh, when we are talking to the numbers of dem demographic criteria, I am very sure that Western Balkan countries do not represent 5%, it's even less. So uh, I think that maybe sometimes we should really think about all these numbers and try to convince the uh, general public in both sides, in our countries and West, as well as the EU countries, that we really we couldn't uh, that we really can't um, destroy any of with that one of two percent of eu that we really can't destroy uh, budget of eu or any high standards it, it will be much easier for us to fulfill all the standards uh, with eu or otherwise uh, very soon we will have only pensioners here in the Western Balkans and anyway all the population of Western Balkans will go to EU and probably will have to fulfill a uh, rule, uh, rule of law. So thank you. Thank you for your um, last intervention and Yuri if you would like to also comment uh, uh, final, uh, one final time the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you, Captain. Uh, I'd like to finish uh, with the hope that German presidency in the EU uh, should give uh, more impetus to implementation of EU Ukraine Association Agreement. We have some particular tasks in order uh, to improve uh, this agreement in a sense of sectoral integration, uh, economic integration, uh, con uh, conclusion of ACAA agreement, so-called industrial free trade regime, and also that uh, German president, uh, presidency also will uh, help, help us to be more resilient, more strength, uh, feel more confident in uh, conflict with Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri, for your last remarks. Um, and now to the speakers who had a chance to already um, intervene again. Ilke, Edgar Gansen, um, did you have any final comments or are you, are you fine? Edgar Gansen is raising his hand, yes. I'd I just like to mention much. that, I, sorry, I, that I enjoyed it very much. And it's, it's many issues that we only raised upon. It's clear that we can't go into detail, so. Um, but it was a good discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, this is uh, um, almost what I was going to say also for, for my final remarks, because I feel that 
we have touched upon many issues and uh, I think what has uh, become very clear again is um, that there are many uh, similarities but also of course some differences between the two regions that we touched upon today uh, but also that the different layers concerning citizens concerning elections um, trade agreements uh, but also rule of law uh, are all intertwined as well as the international order and the relations between the EU and other um, uh, larger countries like China or Russia that were mentioned so that uh, I agree with you, Edgar Gansen, we've touched up on many of these issues and would be interesting to go deeper into these topics. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we will have a chance to do so at, at other occasions and in other conferences. Um, but now it is for me just to thank uh, all the speakers and discussants for taking the time to discuss with us um, the future of the enlargement and the neighborhood policy to all the participants in uh, joining us uh, this afternoon and for those who actively also participated in the discussion. And I would also like to thank my colleagues um, at uh, TEPSA and at the Institute for Europäische Politik for the preparation of this event and for the technical setup uh, as well. And um, I look forward to the discussions uh, on our panels uh, tomorrow at the pre-presidency conference, which will continue uh, tomorrow in the morning. So thank you all again and have a good evening. Goodbye.